Thanks for that extremely long intro. That's great. Um, yes, uh, I don't have much to add to that except that um, I'm a uh, writer, a mate, maker, and a digital content specialist. Um, I recently completed a creative technology residency at an art gallery in Sheffield called the Sight Gallery, and uh, where I live. And I've had two books published, as Anna said, um, a joke book and a satirical game book about entropy. I'm interested in the cultural response to technology and everything to do with time. And I'm going to explain to you how we lost the future. It may sound like I'm about to contradict everything that you've just heard, um, but I, I don't think I am. I think I'm talking about an attitude to the present, really. So hopefully you won't, you know, completely uh, fall apart at this point. Right. So, Jarvis Cocker. Is this the way they say the future's meant to feel, or just 20,000 people standing in a field? And tell me when the spaceship lands, because all this has to start to mean something. That was from Sorted for Even With in 1995. Now, there was a madness in the air around the year 2000, which I think was summed up very well in a number of pulp songs. It's a madness that happens when anticipate, the anticipation of a date is allowed to escalate beyond reason over a period of decades, such that that date becomes an occasion. And it's the anticipation that things will change as a result of us moving into a prescribed future, rather than taking action ourselves. I've given this some thought, and in my view, everyone alive today was at risk of succumbing to this millennium fever, because all of us grew up feeling that on some level we were on the brink of something really important. However, the fever was particularly potent among the young. I turned 21 in the year 2000, and for my generation, it felt personal. It felt as though it was just too much of a coincidence that civilization was coming of age at the same time that I was. We all felt even more special than all the other young people from every other point in history who felt special. Unlike them, we were different. The millennium was an event for people who got excited about indie music, Will Smith, design, modern architecture, the internet, the X-Files, the future. The sense of occasion came to obscure the sense of scale, however, as it always does. And yet such was our investment in the idea, such a byword for optimism had it become, that we built these permanent memorials to it. The Millennium Gallery in Sheffield, the Millennium Bridge in London, the Millennium Bridge in Gateshead, and the Millennium Dome, possibly my favourite. There are literally dozens of these. Have some more. The Millennium Stadium and the Millennium Arts Centre, also known as the Armadillo in Cardiff. The Millennium Seed Bank at Kew. There are loads of footpaths named after the Millennium, Millennium Way, and the Millennium Falcon, the craft piloted by Han Solo in the popular Star Wars series. I feel we're almost embarrassed of these, but we can find a real charm in them. Their optimism, the way they keep hanging in there, going on about the millennium after all these years. They're like photos of us as teenagers. And I feel we need to meditate on this time in our recent past, rather than pretend it never happened, in order to realize where we are and where we are not today. <coughs> For this reason, I've had these two slides made into postcards. It's greetings from the millennium there. And uh, the beautiful millennium. I've, I have actually got postcards of these, so come and see me afterwards if you'd like one. There's a special message on the back as well. Please take them off me. I don't want to take them home. So, I think the fever started sometime in the 60s and gradually ramped up until the year 2000 when it abruptly dissipated as though we were suddenly aware there was too much time for us to fill. Things began to run out of steam. Now in its eighth series, The X-Files was beyond help. <laughs> The millennium bug had gone with a whimper, and silently we moved on. We expected the promise of a fresh thousand years to expand our lives somehow. But the moment we passed through it, it was clear the millennium had an expiry date, and what it had been replaced with was totally out of scale with our human perception. The millennium had come to mean something you build up to. Once it was in the past, it lost all meaning. Nothing is named after the millennium anymore. 
Now that we've crossed that threshold, we find ourselves in an intolerable new epoch. My generation in particular enjoy talking about how we live in the future. I have a number of problems with this, no disrespect to the previous talks. Um, it makes it seem so easy for us to absolve ourselves of any responsibility for the world we live in. It's disingenuous. It makes us complacent about the present. Talking about living in the future makes us think we've earned something, rather than that we have to carry on working towards something. Nothing really changed when the clock struck midnight 12 years ago, but perhaps we perceive things around us, including our own creations, as more futuristic and wonderful than they are, because that's what we grew up expecting. In the same way that people might expect to one day move out of their parents' homes, or learn to drive, or fall in love, a generation whose lives coincided with the calendar grew up expecting to be heirs to an unimaginably space-age era. If our only understanding of the 21st century is one of inherited specialness, then the alternative is a world which may as well not exist, and part of us expects the truth. We need to refocus on the present. It is the only way to immunise ourselves against consumer spin and move into a meaningful future. Thanks to a fortuitous misreading of the Mayan calendar and a need for more meaningful dates in our lives, We've become increasingly interested in the idea of apocalypse recently. It may be that we realise there will never be a date as positive or exciting as the year 2000 again in our lifetimes. Without a significant forthcoming date to attach our destiny to, the idea of a non-existent future suddenly resonates with us. And in fact, as a tactic for refocusing on the present, apocalypses work rather well. I held a series of events themed on different world endings earlier this year. They sold out, and everyone had a good time. But I booked a basement room deliberately. And by the end, there was a very charged atmosphere. Because although everyone was excited, we were actually quite glad to be down there. It's crazy how it builds up over the course of a, a day. This is the picture I think of when I hear the words living in the future. It's a game, it really exists, you can buy it in toy shops and Amazon and stuff. It's called MindFlex, in which a brainwave detecting headset controls air blowers to guide a foam ball around a 3D maze. It looks like it involves some concentration as well. Possibly the reason I think of it as the future is because it's almost identical to the dangerously addictive headset brainwave game played by the inhabitants of the Starship Enterprise in the episode of TNG called The Game. It's a leisure time vision of the future. It suggests we do live in the future and that we've caught up with ourselves. But surely the really interesting future isn't the one that's about crazy toys. It's actually the most banal one that will happen anyway. When we talk about already being here, we throw away the possibility of an incremental future that is taking root in the present as we speak. This is from 2001, by the way, as you probably know. From 2001 a Space Odyssey, not the year 2001, obviously. <laughs> It'd be crazy. Um, it is how, it is AI, but it's also the in inevitable, everyday reality of in-flight meals on outer space travel. My concern is that in our determination that things are at their most exciting right now, we do ourselves out of the real joy of thinking of the present as the beginning of something. And in case you think, in case you've started to think that I've begun to lose it a bit, I decided to speak to some experts to reinforce my theory. And I spoke to Nick Pope. Um, no one knows millennial madness like Nick. Uh, he was put in charge of the unexplained reports at the Ministry of Defence in the late 90s. And when he left in 2006, he announced the X-Files have been closed down. So he's quite game for this kind of thing. He wouldn't mind me doing that uh, with the alien thing. He is the real Fox Mulder. And he turns up regularly on any news item about strange phenomena. He had this to say about the millennium. After the moon landings, we believed we'd be holidaying on the moon by the year 2000. But the media deceives and progress is often slower than we think. We romanticise the past... We look forward to significant dates in the future, and in the process, we dismiss the present. 
So to back him up, in case you don't believe in the real Fox Mulder, I uh, spoke to one of my former professors at Cambridge, David Trotter. He's an uh, expert in 20th century culture and cinema. He said, some future is needed to prevent the past being our only influence. If we drill down into the present, we will always find situations that cannot be allowed to continue. The best future will arise out of realizing the worst present must be negated, not this binding of the past to the future that smooths over the present. Which is, of course, exactly what's happened with the millennium. As we move forward in time, we drag the sense of future back towards us until it's smothered the present completely. It may not be as glamorous, it may not travel by flying car, but for better or worse, the present needs reanimating. It can feel as though the reality of the present is the one thing it is intolerable to look at directly. Fantasies will always be more alluring. But if it is compelling enough to hold our attention, a fantasy can sometimes be a great interpreter for the, for the present moment. A character called John Titer appeared on an internet forum in the year 2000, when else, claiming to be a visitor from the year 2036. He spent several months chatting to the forum and answering questions about his time period before disappearing entirely. These are some pictures that he supplied them with. You can see his time machine here. Uh, it's, uh, I won't go into great detail, but it's, it, this is it built into his car, which is a 1967 Chevrolet. You probably can tell from that. Um, so, yeah, so he, he had a lot of evidence for, the, for his, uh, his claims. He was actually surprisingly convincing. You, you may laugh, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, until proven guilty and all that. He said he'd been sent back to collect some vintage technology to help debug future machinery. And he brought news of a world which had been torn apart by nuclear war and had reverted to a largely pre-industrial society. He also brought a critique of our contemporary society. This is his uh, insignia, by the way. It's <laughs> I should get them done as badges or something. Um, it's, uh, it represents the, um, the theory of time travel that he, um, he used, I should say. It's not a theory, it's real. Um, he said, I should let you on, in on a little secret. No one likes you in the future. This time period is, being, is looked upon as being full of lazy, self-centered, civically ignorant sheep. You eat poisoned food, buy manufactured products that no one needs, and turn an uncaring eye away from millions of people suffering and dying all around you. Uh, these are some scans. I mean, it's, you know, it's <laughs> looking at these after that kind of meaningful quote um, may throw it into less... Um, it may seem a little bit more uh, unstable than it may have done otherwise, but these are the, some scans from the Haynes-style technical manual that he supplied uh, to the workings of his time machine. Um, I think it would be irresponsible for me to reproduce them in any more detail than that, um, at least until it's proven either way. The point is, his future was actually rather banal. Um, it was an engineer's future that was rooted firmly in the past, and because of that, I think it's utterly mesmerizing. So just in summary, we've grown up in a, with a sense of anticipation, which leads us to feel deserving. Putting a time limit on the millennium and trying to forget it reinforces our impression that we're these special future people. The future we may be losing is an attainable one, which we have to work for. And the solution to that is to have increased awareness of the present. This can be achieved by considering the possibility of no future and through the humility and realism within our own presence. And just a few words to conclude. The lost millennium shows that if a future is ever so prescribed that it can fall within our grasp, it will become a fashion item. It becomes aspirational. <coughs> something can be, that can be designed and bought but never quite related to or fulfilled. To say we live in the future is an expression of a predestination fantasy. This way of thinking is cheating us out of our most exciting reality of growing and achieving a future. We can be John Titus to our own pasts, even to the millennium, come and get postcard. 
and find a sense of perspective on it. We can know a future and a past because both are traced on us already. And this knowledge will help us to examine the present, which is, after all, all we have. Thank you very much. <laughs>